Well, good morning and welcome. We're glad that you're able to join together with us. We gather as Grace Bible Church. Though we are scattered in different places, we are one in heart and mind wanting to honor the Lord together this morning. Pastor David is starting a new series this morning in the book of 1 Peter entitled A Scattered People. You'll see how Peter's letter written to people in that first century, new believers, the new church, people were struggling with the same issues that we are facing today. And it's flowing right out of the Gospel of Mark that we've been studying recently. Three quick announcements before we move to the message. First is a request for you to join together with us in praying for the Belvedere's. Frank's surgery is tomorrow, and they would certainly appreciate prayers for patience, strength, peace, and wisdom for the doctors as they operate. Second thing is a new opportunity. There is a virtual connection group starting. You might have not been able to join a group in the fall. Maybe it just didn't work out timing-wise, getting there, arranging babysitting. This virtual group means you can log in from home, wherever you are. We're meeting on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. And if you'd like to be part of that, we'd love to have you. Just email me at gbcbyronb at gmail. Dot com, and I'll get you connected. The third thing is an opportunity. If you're able-bodied and interested and you've got the time available, Bridges could use your help. They've had a number of their volunteers step back for various reasons in this pandemic time, and they could use any help that we're able to give. If you'd like to be part of that, again, contact me and we'll make the connection. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that though we are scattered, you would remind us that we are one in you. We ask that you would speak to us through your word and through David as he opens your word. So we look at 1 Peter. Bless this time, we pray, not just this morning, but in the weeks ahead, as we see these truths that you have given to us for our benefit that we can honor you in our situation as well. Take this time together, we ask. Draw attention to yourself. Remind us of the blessings that are ours in Jesus Christ. We ask it in his name. Amen. We're thankful that you're able to join us this morning. We're especially thankful because we're starting a new series in 1 Peter. 1 Peter is a book about hope. It's a book about those who will grow in hope even though they're in very difficult circumstances. In all that's taking place, this alienated pilgrim people find a living hope. I need hope. I know you need hope. So I'm glad we can journey through this book together, finding living hope. I also want to take just a, a moment to remind us to continue to pray and reach out to one another, those in the GBC family. Um, as time goes on, we can become weary or we become tired or, or even, you know, become, uh, find little hope. Our hope can disappear. Uh, so I encourage you not to grow weary. Um, who have you reached out to this past week? Who can you reach out to this coming week in the GBC family? And, and just take a few moments to write them or Zoom them uh, and just encourage them in the Lord. I also received an email this past week from a country that I visit on a regular basis and I was reminded of the struggles in that country. Uh, one of the pastors that um, is part of the teaching group has passed away from COVID. Uh, four other pastors have COVID and in this particular country, uh, they're finding it difficult to, to find food. They're having to go further and further away to find food. And so um, we wanna pray for not only one another, but we wanna pray for our country and we wanna pray for countries around the world that are being uh, specifically impacted by this. We wanna pray that among believers, hope would remain 
And for those who do not know Jesus Christ, that they would come to a saving knowledge of him. So let's pray together as we start our service this morning. Father God, we pray for hope. But we pray much bigger than that, because we know that hope in Scripture is not just what we might wish for, but hope is an assurance of what is accomplished. We pray for living hope. We pray for growing hope. And help us as we journey through this series to grow in hope as we grow in faith because we see the praises and the beauty and the wonder of a Savior, of a God who sent his Son, Jesus, so that we might have life now and everlasting. We pray for our country. We pray for countries around the world. We pray for those who are suffering, those who have lost loved ones. We pray for your comfort. We want to pray specifically for countries and, and believers that are having particularly difficult times through this uh, COVID pandemic. Lord, draw close. May your mercies be upon them. May they, may they be filled with Christ. And may we not forget those who are alienated, who are without hope, Lord, give us a voice of hope in these times. Now, as we study God's word together, we just pray that you would give us that focus and that, that sense of anticipation of what you will do by the living word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To those chosen, living as exiles, dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now, for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him. And you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It's encouraging that Peter wrote this letter. Peter needed hope. You may remember his story when we left the book of Mark. Peter resisted the cross of Jesus Christ. He said, Jesus, you will never die. Peter ran away when Judas betrayed him. And then we remember that final act in the book of Mark, the denial of Jesus. Not once, not three times Peter denied that he knew Jesus. Peter needed hope. And I think that's probably why he wrote such an encouraging book to those who are suffering. And the book is about a living hope. Peter's hope had been reborn. You and I need hope. Living hope. Peter writes a letter because he knows that we can begin to despair or he knows we can go to dark places, or he knows we can want to give up 
especially when we face some of the challenges that Peter writes about in his book. This hope isn't lived apart from the world. This, this hope is found in a challenging, dark world. We will read of faith challenges in 1 Peter. We will read of temptations. How do we grow to be a holy people? We will read about injustices and suffering, relational hurts. How do we live together in love? How do we seek to care for one another? We will read of times of discouragement and despair. Are you hopeful? Do you have a living hope? Are you growing in hope? Peter is going to battle for you in this letter. He is going to battle for a people to have this hope. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12, the book, the final few verses of the book, we read, I have written to you briefly in order to encourage you and to testify that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. That's why Peter wrote, so that you would have a living hope, that you would be encouraged despite everything that you're going through, and that you would stand in the grace of God and not give up. So we want to journey together and explore this living hope. In verses 1 and 2, we're going to see the living hope that is explained. In verses 3 through 5, we're going to see the living hope that's expressed. And then finally, in verses 6 through 9, we're going to see the living hope that is challenged. The living hope that is explained, expressed, and challenged. In verses 1 and 2, we see a living hope that is explained. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and then he writes, These are whom I have written to. He says, To the chosen. We are those who are the elect of God. We can say, I know I am chosen. It could not have been me who responded first. I was dead in my sins. I was lost. I was, I was taken by darkness. But God loved me first. And I know all the, I have all these privileges and all these blessings and it's absolute grace. There's no boasting in all of this. But even though I am a chosen elect child of God, I am also in exile to those chosen living as exiles. The word exile is like alien, belonging to a foreign nation. I'm a stranger. I'm a pilgrim. I'm a sojourner. I'm restless. This world is not my final home. Something's off. I think differently. I hold to different beliefs. I seem out of place. When I'm asked to get along or compromise, I find myself asking, how do I stand firm in the grace of God? I just feel different, like Abraham, who was a pilgrim wandering, longing for his home, for his final rest. We are elect, we are exiles, but we are also the dispersed, the scattered. I think we get a sense of this in what we're going through with the COVID pandemic. We endure alienation in this world. We're a scattered people. Really, it's, it's not just the reality of, what, um, of the Christian life, but it's also Old Testament language. To be a scattered Old Testament uh, people is to be a harassed people. It is to be a helpless people. They're, they're, they're people without a shepherd. And that's how we can feel. We can feel like we're scattered and people without a shepherd, lost and wandering. And we need a great shepherd. So we are elect, we are exiles, we are dispersed or scattered. And then finally, he says, we are those who are um, scattered in different cities, Pontius, Galatia, the other cities. In other words, I will spend my life not only as an exile, not only scattered, but I will spend my life in this world, but not of this world. If you were to look at the various cities, they would have the rich and the poor, they would have free and slave, they would have, uh, they would, some would be along the coast, some would be inland. In other words, we live among the cities. We are a people among people. We are those who are of the world, are in the world, but not of the world. Hebrews chapter 11 probably says it best. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 
they all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. They saw what they were headed towards, but they were foreigners. They were temporary residents on the earth. That's how Peter describes our position. We are those who are elect, but we're in exile. We're scattered, and we're a people who will spend our life in the world, but not of the world. And that's why life can be so discouraging. That's why we can despair. That's why Peter writes this letter. He's writing to those who are exiled, sojourners. So how does Peter speak of hope? How does Peter explain this living hope? He says in verse 2, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. That is an anchoring truth in our life. That is a foundational truth that we must stand upon. Our entire life, our exile, our scattering, our in this world but not of the world is according to the foreknowledge of God. Sometimes we think the foreknowledge of God is just about our salvation, that we are the elect. But Paul builds, in, or Peter builds in verse 2, and he says, God does not just foreknow our salvation, but God foreknows our life. This hostile environment, the temptations, the injustice, the suffering, they were all known by God before the world began. All came about in accordance to his foreknowledge, in accordance to his divine plan. No trial reaches us. No suffering reaches us apart from God's specific decrees and permissions. It's like we read in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. The Lord brings death and the Lord makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. That is the foreknowledge of God. And knowledge is not just in the sense of knowing, but knowledge is relational. It is this fatherly love that God has for his people. He knows your struggles. He knows your greatest suffering. He foreknew it. And he would bring you through that in relationship by his love. And it may be injustice or it may be suffering or it may be relational hurts. But God foreknew. And God will carry you through your greatest hurts because he affirms his fatherly care. That is the living hope that we have. How does he do that? He does that by the sanctifying work of the Spirit so that we grow in obedience, so that because we're sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, he foreknew all that would take place. And even in our suffering and even in all of our circumstances, God is going to do this amazing work where he is going to sanctify you. The Holy Spirit is going to work in your life as you are surrounded by your greatest battles. And the Holy Spirit is going to continue to give you hope, going to continue to give you life and strength. And not just strength to get through, but as we'll see a little later, he will grow you according to the will of God into the person of God. He will cleanse you. He will sanctify you. He will purify you. He will grow you in praise and hope in your greatest battles in life because of the work of Jesus Christ. Our hope is found in the triune work of God, the fatherly care, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, and then the cross of Jesus Christ. We see the cross of Jesus Christ calls us to be obedient, sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. Sprinkled again is Old Testament language, which basically says we're cleansed, we're forgiven. It is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us this hope. And then finally he says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Isn't that a beautiful way to end it all? Here's what hope is. Grace and peace. Grace is the enabling work of God in your life. Peace is this rest that you find in Him. And it's multiplied. 
in whatever circumstances you may be going through. It's not just, in other words, we will be overwhelmed with the grace and the peace given to us by God. Remember Elijah, surrounded by the Arameans? I call this the coffee time with Elijah. Wakes up in the morning, a, an army surrounds him and the servant. And his servant panics and is filled with fear. And we read that Elijah, when asked the question, what do we do? Elijah says, don't be afraid. For those who are with us outnumber those who are with them. And then he says, Lord, please open his eyes and let him see. And when he opens his eyes, he sees the chariots of God's army surround. And that's what hope is. Grace is always multiplied. Peace is always multiplied because of the foreknowledge of God. And in the most dark circumstances, he is sanctifying his people by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if that is where we find hope, if that's hope explained, then in verses 3 through 5, how is hope expressed? Living hope expressed in verses 3 through 5. In other words, how do we not only maintain hope, but how do we grow in hope? And what we're going to see is we're going to see hope um, really has three key words. Praise, hope, the, the word itself, and then faith. So we're going we're to watch that happen. When, Paul, when Peter begins his, um, his teaching on hope, he begins with praise. Where does hope start? Hope starts with praise. So in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope starts with humility, bowing before the greatness of God, grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what he does is he gives us five unchanging truths that give praise to God. Five unchanging truths that are grounded in the gospel of Jesus, which secure our hope. Remember, hope isn't something we wish for. Hope is solid. Hope is having the assurance. So how do we praise God? You think of some of the sufferings or some of the alienation and you say, well, I don't know how much I have to praise God for. And Paul and Peter comes and he says, here are five unchanging gospel truths that secure our hope. Whatever circumstances you find yourselves in, we can praise God. We can have hope by faith because of these five truths. First of all, we read, he has given us a new birth. He has given us a new birth into a living hope. Literally, he has caused us to be born again. God's work in us. He made us alive in all his power, with all his love. Our salvation is the work of God. He has caused us to be born again. He has given us a new birth. The first unchanging truth that no circumstance can take away from you is that you have a living or you have a new birth. You are a child of God. The second unchanging truth is you have a living hope. We may not experience hope. In fact, we may be in very dark places despairing, but that doesn't mean that the hope is removed. We have this living hope. Whether you hope or not, there is always hope. The third unchanging truth is this happens through the resurrection. We saw this last week. The resurrection historically cannot be denied. The resurrection when Jesus rose from the dead, his power can never be taken from him. He is raised into glory. He sits at the right hand of God. And when we read of the resurrection, you have resurrection strength. You have resurrection power to stand firm in his grace. The resurrection can never be taken from you. It is an unchanging truth. And because you have a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection, you have an inheritance. An inheritance is, very, is a relational moment. If you are to inherit you, money from someone, you have a relationship with them. We have a relationship with God and we are, we have a relationship with God and therefore we are um, blessed with his inheritance. 
we receive the riches of the glory of God. And then you read, this is an inheritance that is imperishable. It will never be taken from you. It will never die. It is undefiled. It is completely pure. There will be no impact of Satan. There will be no impact of sin. And not only is it imperishable and undefiled, but it is unfailing. Our lives are like the grass of the field. We will one day perish. We live in a defiled world. We will one day, um, you know, fail. Just our, our lives are like the grass of the field. The flowers fade. But this inheritance, it only gets better and better and better. It's an undeniable truth. It's an unchanging truth. And here's the most amazing part. Not only do you have a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of an inheritance, which is imperishable, undefiled, unfailing, but it is kept in heaven for you. It is kept by God. And not only is it kept by God, but you are being guarded by God's power. We read that in verse 5. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Those are five unchanging truths. And the instrument that God uses to bring it all together so that we praise because we have hope is faith. It's faith. Trusting in God's power, God's work, God's achievement. If you think of those moments where you lacked hope, one or all three of those truths were missing. We stopped praising God. Then we lost hope because we began to lose faith. And that's why Paul, Peter spends his time talking about the grace and the peace and sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and being obedient and sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ, these major themes in the book of Peter, because we read that it, it is grabbing onto them. It is trusting them. It is trusting these truths that give us hope that lead us to praise. We can gauge our hope in how we praise God. We can gauge our faith in how much we hope and how much we praise. Our living hope is directly connected to our faith, which is directly connected to our praise. If that is living hope, that is expressed, then we read finally of living hope that is challenged. Living hope that's challenged. It's interesting because Peter writes a very honest book. Peter encourages them to be honest about what they're going through. There's a great challenge in life among an exiled, scattered people who are suffering who are facing so many challenges that they fear that their hope is going to be destroyed. So what does Peter say about this living hope that's challenged? Well, notice in verse 6, this is very interesting. You rejoice in this. What do you rejoice in? You rejoice in the blessings of God, the foreknowledge of God, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, the, the gospel that Jesus sprinkled his blood, he cleansed us and he forgave us. You rejoice in the five unchanging truths that you have a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection into an inheritance kept in heaven and you are being guarded by the power of God. There is nothing can, that can take away the salvation of God, the work of Jesus Christ from your life, no matter the circumstances. That's what we rejoice in. That's what we hold on to. But then he says this, and there's something unique that happens with this part of the verse. You rejoice in this, even though, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. I think this is what Peter does with that verse. Peter is very honest with your sufferings. We've said this before. The Bible, God, never minimizes your suffering. God never says, just get over it. God never just says, it's okay, don't, like, don't worry about it. He never minimizes what you're going through. 
Suffering hurts. Peter, the great shepherd, he said, I, I know what it is to live without hope, to despair after I deny the name of Jesus Christ three times. I know what it is to be without hope. I know what it is to suffer. And I don't minimize your sufferings. If you're hurting, if you're living in darkness and despair, Peter knows. In fact, we read, we'll read later on that um, Jesus knows. Jesus knows in an even greater way the darkness that you will never experience because he stood before God suffering our wrath. But the suffering led to his glory. But his suffering was never minimized. Our suffering is never minimized. You rejoice in the blessings and the truths of God and his work. But if necessary, you're going to suffer grief and it will be in various trials. That's our world that we live in. So much of our hearts will experience that. We will be filled with grief. There will be trial after trial. And in our sufferings, long or short, here's the temptation. That we're going to be tempted to forget. We're going to be tempted to say, to let go of our faith. We're going to be tempted to give up hope. Because we forget or we begin to doubt. Or even, like Peter, we begin to deny. So how does Peter build up our faith? How does God take suffering and not destroy our hope? How does God take suffering and not destroy our hope? So in these last three verses, this is what Peter is going to do. First of all, Peter is going to show us how he grows our faith. How God grows our faith in the midst of suffering. Remember, faith, hope, praise. And then in verses 8 and 9, not only does God grow our faith, but God grows our hope in the midst of suffering. So God grows our faith in the midst of suffering, and then God grows our hope in the midst of suffering. And then we'll wrap up with a few closing comments. Look at verse 7. If necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think this is the sanctifying work that is spoken of in verse 2. This is the work of God by His Spirit in our lives. What is more valuable than gold? That's a good question, right? Actually, that's a question that we often ask when we're suffering. Is this worth it? Why is God cramping my style? Why am I suffering? And then God says, the most precious thing on earth, gold, what's more valuable than that? This is what God says. What's more valuable than gold is actually your faith. He says, you suffer in various trials so that the proven character of your faith and what is he doing during suffering? He's refining, just like gold. But your faith is more valuable. So God is going to take in your life times when you will grieve and when you will go through various trials, deep trials, so that he will refine your faith. And then look at the faith, how the faith is built. He says, more valuable than gold, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. At the end of it all, you will find yourself, and even in suffering, you will find yourself praising, glorifying God. God grows our faith in the midst of suffering. Whatever you're going through, God is taking this time to strengthen your faith so that you grow in hope, so that you grow in praise. Not only does God grow our faith, but these final two verses, God grows our hope in the midst of suffering. It's strange to think of it this way, isn't it? If there are those who are outside looking in, they'll say, well, like Job, why, why do you still confess the name of God? Curse God and die. 
If that's what means, if that's what a Christian means, being a Christian means, then I don't want anything to do with that type of God. But from those who are suffering, those who are going through various trials, they begin to say, God is refining my faith. I thought that was important. I lost sight of God there. But God's refining. God's focusing my faith on what's important. So gold isn't as important as my relationship with God. And God's love is so great that he will never let go of my faith. In fact, he will grow my faith so I grow in hope, so I grow in praise. And so in verses 8 and 9, as he grows our faith, he also grows our hope. Listen to what he says in verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though, you, though not seeing him now, you believe in him. And you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know what's interesting about verses 8 and 9? They're just faith statements. In other words, verse 7 has built up our faith. Okay, this is where God's going to challenge my faith. And then in verses 8 and 9, here's the hope. This is what hope looks like. These are faith statements. Where does, where, what, what is the first one that he says? Though you have not seen him, you love him. What, why is that a faith statement? Because you love him. How many times when we go through suffering do we question the love of God? Do we question uh, the love of Jesus, the presence of the Holy Spirit to sustain us? We begin to doubt his love. Is God good? But Peter comes along and he says, when your faith is refined, this is what hope begins to look like. Hope begins to look like though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you not seen him now, you believe in him. That's another great challenge to faith. You just don't believe in him. But Peter says, though not seeing him now, you believe in him. That's hope. These are all, these are all faith, hope moments. You don't see him. You have not seen him, but you love him. You don't doubt his love. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him. You don't doubt his truth. You don't stop trusting Jesus. You rejoice and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. You don't stop praising. You know that uh, you, you don't doubt the work of God the Father. You don't stop saying, blessed be the name of the God, our God, our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, you don't stop hoping. You don't stop loving. You don't stop trusting. You don't stop praising. You don't stop hoping. You don't stop uh, doubting the, or you don't doubt the work of the Holy Spirit to carry you forward. All of these are faith statements giving us hope. What are our greatest challenges when we're about to give up hope? We doubt the love of God. We doubt the presence of the gospel. We stop trusting the gospel. We stop praising God and we stop hoping because we don't think the Holy Spirit is going to carry us through. But this is where Paul or Peter ends when he says, God is refining your faith. And then in verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. You do not doubt the love of God in your life. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him. You do not doubt the truth of God in your life. And you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. You do not stop praising God because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You do not stop looking ahead and seeing with hope all that is yours in the presence of the triune God. That's hope. That's what hope looks like. Hope is being overwhelmed with the blessing of God in the person of Christ by the presence of the Holy Spirit as he builds your faith, which allow you to stand firm. If we're struggling with living hope, with hope that grows and matures over time in the Christian life, it's because we begin to doubt his love. We begin to stop trusting. We begin to stop praising. And then we begin to stop anticipating the final coming of Jesus Christ. But hope is being overwhelmed with the blessings of God in Christ by the Spirit 
as he builds our faith, which allows us then to stand firm. And that's the book of Peter. The book of Peter gives us this hope. It builds up our faith. It refines our faith so that we stand firm in the grace that God has given us. I want to encourage you this morning to stand firm in the hope, to see the grace or to see the living hope that is explained in verses 1 and 2, expressed in verses 3 through 6. There are five unchanging truths that today give you pause to praise God. You have a new birth. Grace and peace are multiplied every day to sustain you. And then even though your, your hope may be challenged, you are able by God's presence to battle doubt. He loves you. He has been raised from the dead. He not only loves you, but you can trust him. The foreknowledge of God. You can not only trust him, but you can praise him today. Not only praise him because of the inexpressible joy that is ours in the gospel, even though we may be going through these various trials that bring grief, but we can praise him in anticipation that this undefiled, imperishable glory that is to come is not only being kept for us, but we are being kept by, guarded by, protected by the power of God. And that is worthy of praise. I want to close with this thought. If you have watched the podcast this past week, you know we're beginning a series of books. And the first book, this is an older version of it that we want to read through so that um, we, we travel through the beginning of the journey, basic Christianity, how we're saved, um, who Jesus is and who we are in the presence of Jesus, all the way to um, how we live out this life through suffering with um, Johnny Erickson Tata's book, When God Weeps. But I was struck by the first few um, paragraphs of chapter one from this book. And this is how I want to just close our message today. I want to read this and, gen, and then just apply it. He writes, In the beginning, God. The first four words of the Bible are more than an introduction to the creation story or the book of Genesis. They supply the key which opens our understanding to the Bible as a whole. They tell us that the religion of the Bible is a religion of the initiative of God. That's good, isn't it? In the beginning, God. Those four words tell us that everything that we read is the initiative of God. And then this paragraph. You can never take God by surprise. You can never anticipate him. He always makes the first move. He is always there in the beginning. Before man existed, God acted. Before man stirs himself to seek God, God has sought man. In the Bible, we do not see man groping after God. We see God reaching after man. You may say to yourself today, I don't have a lot of hope. I look around and I see everything and I'm losing hope. But here's the hope that you have. Everything that we have read this morning is God's initiative. God pursues you. God will keep you. God will guard you. God will refine your, your faith so you will be a 1 Peter 1 eight and nine believer. First Peter one verses eight and nine will be your faith statement. God, I love you. I trust you. I praise you because you keep me. And whatever I will go through today, I will start with praise, which will lead to hope because you have refined my faith. And as we journey through first Peter together, we will see Peter builds our hope to the praise and glory of his name. Let's pray. Father God, for those who listen and are without hope, may you build their hope. For those who listen 
and they are just in a dark place. May they find a place of praise. And for all of us, we want to praise you that you are a pursuing God. The story of the Bible tells us in the beginning, you took the initiative. You not only created, but you save. And so, Father, save and give us hope. Lord, lift us up, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, for, thank you for joining us. We are praying for you. We are trusting that God is sustaining you and giving you hope. May God bless.